Good morning and welcome to my presentation. Arnold Cook studied with Paul Hindemith in Berlin at the Hochschule für Musik between 1929 and 1932, leaving with immaculate timing just before the end of the Weimar Republic and Hitler's rise to power. His time with Hindemith had provided him with a very secure technique as a composer and a well-developed knowledge of the piano and all the orchestral instruments. Hindemith had insisted that his students understand the idiosyncrasies of the various instruments in order to be able to write effectively for them and to ingratiate themselves with potential performers. In support of this study, Hindemith had encouraged all his students to learn the basics of instruments other than their own, which he then formed into a group he referred to as the Robbers Orchestra, on account of the appalling racket they made. He also set projects for his students to compose for unusual combinations of instruments, thus developing their understanding and control of texture, balance and sonorities. In Cook's case, this had resulted in a sextet for brass, then a highly unusual chamber combination, a passicalia, scherzo and finale for mixed string and wind octet, and a quintet for harp, flute, clarinet, violin and cello. These were the few works which he retained from this student period, whether as examples to consult in later years or because he was genuinely pleased with them. Whatever the reason, Cook was to continue composing for unusual combinations of instruments throughout his compositional life. The Sonata for Two Pianos fits into this cat category. Although there are numerous short pieces for two pianos from the early 20th century, extended works are few and far between. Hindemith wrote a sonata in 1942 and Poulenc in 1953. Stravinsky's Sonata for Two Pianos also post-dates Cook's, having been completed in 1943, although his first offering in the genre, which he entitled Concerto for Two Solo Pianos, had appeared in 1935. Cook did admit in a radio broadcast for the BBC in 1966 that Stravinsky's concerto had made a considerable impression on him, and that he had probably been influenced by it to some extent. However, the format and language are very different from Cook's work, and any influence appears confined to a textural approach, although even here Stravinsky's writing is less formally contrapuntal, except of course in the final fugue. Stravinsky must have realised that in a four-part texture, clarity was much easier to achieve with four rather than two hands. For Cook, two pianos, four hands also offered the perfect medium for his highly contrapuntal idiom, and in many ways could not be better suited to his music of this period. Aside from the Stravinsky, virtually no other contemporary compositional models existed for Cook, aside from Arnold Bax's example. The Bax Sonata, written for Ethel Bartlett and Ray, Robinson, uh, Ray Robertson in 1929, is in a decidedly English pastoral vein, very different from Cook's. I have no evidence that Cook knew this work, but there are very superficial similarities in that each work is in three movements. Each first movement begins with a slow introduction, and both sonatas finish with a light-hearted, virtuosic tour de force. Probably begun in the autumn of 1936, Arnold Cook's sonata was completed early the following year. It was written in response to a request from the pianists Adolf Halles and Franz Reitzenstein. The sonata received its first performance on the 17th of March 1937 at the Aeolian Hall, London, in a concert that was part of Halles's own series, The Seventeen Concerts. Other enthusiastic performers of the sonata were Lucy Pierce and John Brennan in Manchester, and later the Pepin sisters, Geraldine and Mary. The work gained an almost immediate success in that it was one of eight selected from a total of nearly 70 by the Reading Committee of the International Society for Contemporary Music for inclusion in the British section at their festival in Krakow between the 13th and 21st of April 1939. Cast in three movements, the work begins with a solemn, slow introduction to its fast, sonata form first movement. A still quicker coda balances the opening and finishes the movement with a flourish. The two pianos are given equal weighting, sharing all of the musical material. 
and the writing is idiomatic for the keyboard at all times. The slow movement has an ABA structure, the B section retaining the same triple time meter as the outer parts, but in compound as opposed to simple time. This gives the effect of more movement despite the same pulse. To conclude, Cook writes a very quick tarantella, alternating it with an even faster gallop, a tongue-in-cheek movement that provides the perfect balance to the lyrical slow movement and at times austere first movement. My world premiere recording of the sonata with my mother, Helen, has been re released this month on the NPR label alongside Cook's complete chamber works for oboe. And it is available on application to me. Recording any music to today's exacting studio standards is challenging enough, but those presented by two piano music are especially tricky. Precise ensemble is the first and most obvious difficulty. Hard enough for four hands at one keyboard, never mind with two pianos, where the normal concert arrangement, tessellating the two instruments along their curved edges, prevents the performers from seeing one another's hands. As visual presentation is not an issue for audio recording, Mum and I chose to arrange the pianos with keyboards side by side, a decision that probably saved us several hours of takes. And I have to admit that, experienced as we are as a four-hand duo, and we've worked together for some 30 years, we have specialised in working at one piano, as much for logistical reasons as those of repertoire. The two piano medium is very different. Issues of balance and voicing are compounded by the fact that the textures are bound to be fuller, given the freedom that the composer has to exploit two full keyboards. Furthermore, any duo has to make a choice between attempting to try and match individual sound production on two instruments, or celebrating the inevitable differences between any two pianos. So, for instance, the way the texture at the beginning of the slow movement is treated, in terms of our respective sound productions, will be quite different from the way we approach the beginning of the first movement allegro section. In the latter, because the writing is imitative and overtly contrapuntal, matching sounds is perhaps more important to give an overall effect of unity of texture, although clarity of voicing is a primary concern. From our new recording, here is the opening of the allegro from the first movement. The slow movement ends with what is essentially melody and accompaniment, so more obviously balanced and differentiated playing is necessary between the two pianists. Here is the beginning of that movement as far as bar 28. <laughs> 
As you will have heard from the excerpts, this music is written in what might have been described by some as a traditional manner for 1937, although a review of the first Manchester performance, given on the 29th of November 1937 by Lucy Pierce and John Brennan, eight months after the premiere, says that, and I quote, Though at times the composer rejoices so percussively that he would have liked marrow bones and cleaver, or even an electric drill instead of a couple of mere pianos, the music is inspired by something far deeper than hard and incessant ingenuity. The fanciful ideas that chase each other through the vigorous sections come not only from an alert craftsmanship, but from a glowing imagination. The avant-garde music of the period was still associated with the Second Viennese School and, for the very brave, the microtonality of the Czech composer Alois Haber. Cook's music, like that of his German professor Hindemith, is essentially rooted in the masculine classicism of Brahms, and whilst that was still acceptable in late 1930s Manchester, it was to become something of a mixed blessing in the years after the war for Cook. A further seven decades have elapsed since VE Day, and although little of the output of either Hindemith or the Viennese Second Viennese School is regularly found on the modern concert platform, the music of Brahms and the 19th century German tradition arching back as far as J.S. Bach certainly is. This has allowed a familiarity with Cook's idiom that is precisely what he was aiming for. His aesthetic, in a nutshell, was to compose music that was at once modern in language, yet traditional in structure. Today, that should still resonate, and I believe that with the obje objectivity lent by the passing of time, Cook's music is worthy of a serious re-evaluation to determine its own intrinsic value, removed as it is from the prejudices of its time. Hindemith had described music composed for a specific occasion and in a style acceptable to both connoisseurs and amateurs as Gebrauchsmusik. Faced with criticism in later years, he came to regret coining this term, and Cook's music has also suffered by association with his teacher. However, that very tradition, so well understood by modern performers and listeners, has ensured that this music retains its immediacy for the experienced performer. Thus, our approach to interpretation was similar to the way we would approach a Brahms sonata, or indeed one by Hindemith. We placed important importance on clarity of texture and, sing and structure, and a singing tone. Rubato gui was guided by phrasing, harmony, and the composer's own markings, and that meant the learning of the music was intuitive and comfortable. After the premiere of this sonata and its publication four years later, there were at least three performances and its first broadcast, all given by Lucy Pierce and John Brennan, who worked regularly together in Manchester. Pierce had been a student of Egon Petri and Ferruccio Busoni and taught at the RMCM, where Brennan had studied with her for six years between 1927 and 1933, and both pianists were proud champions of contemporary British music. Cook was still working in Manchester until the summer of 1938, by which time two of these performances and the broadcast had taken place. As this was prior to the publication, it meant that Pierce and Brennan had worked from a manuscript copy, as had Hallis and Reitzenstein for the first performance, and possibly the same one. However, it is well documented that Cook was happy to make new manuscript copies for different performers to use, and he had a practised and legible hand. Here is an example. This manuscript has clearly been used for performance, as can be seen from the fingering added to the left hand of the primo part in the first two bars of the example. Under a strong light, the manuscript reveals many such performance markings, originally made in pencil but subsequently erased. Whoever removed the markings obviously missed these particular fingerings, as similar markings are removed virtually everywhere else. Fortunately, they are all still legible though, and provide a valuable store of performance practice information from either the first or at least a very, a very early performance. I can't be certain which performers made these markings, but my suspicion is that it was Hallis and Reitzenstein, given the continental written style of the figure one 
Further discussion of these markings is for a future paper on performance practice. But to conclude, I would like to mention another significant set of differences between this manuscript and the OUP edition, which may also point towards this as having been Hallis and Reitzenstein's copy. In all, there are some 153 variants between this manuscript and the first published edition, including many dynamic alterations, some pedalling and articulatory changes, as well as a few different pitches and changes of register. Fundamentally, the music and musical effects remain unchanged, with no additional passages or radical rewriting. Koch has clarified his tempo instructions for the first and last movements, adding metronome marks for the first edition. And this slide shows an example of the variants, in this case, some of those in the second movement. It would seem to indicate that a revised version was made by Cook specifically for the publisher, with the retrospective benefit of at least three performances and a broadcast by the Manchester duo. Cook was in Manchester until late summer 1938 and would have had the opportunity to work with Pearson Brennan on the sonata. Thus, it may well be that they had suggested the changes and which Cook was evidently happy to implement. Evidence from later performers of his music and from a number of his own letters make it quite clear that Cook was always comfortable accepting practical advice from players. In fact, he actively sought it, if writing for an unfamiliar instrument. Examples of this exist in letters to the recorder player Carl Dolmetsch and the bassoonist Roger Bernstingel. Helen and I decided to stick with the text of the OUP edition when making our recording, given that it represents the composer's most recent thoughts. But it would be truly fascinating if another manuscript copy ever does come to light to test my hypotheses about the provenance of this one. Thank you for listening.